Um, so welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario, uh, another in our taking advantage of the distance um, meetings. Uh, so today we're going to have a, uh, an interesting conversation with Doug Schuler, who I would actually say outside of Christopher Alexander may have uh, written or edited the most number of patterns that's actually been published. Um, so it'll be interesting going through that. Um, what I put up in the beginning is something that people can take a look at uh, if you have another screen, uh, labs.publicspearproject.org. Um, and this is work in progress that Doug has been working on. Um, I'm gonna ask him later on to, um, to kind of take us through some of, people can actually choose whatever pattern they're interested in. But uh, one of the problems I see with the pattern language and patterns in general is that people get really abstract quite quickly about patterns. Um, and uh, having concrete patterns is really helpful to, to having a discussion about, well, you know, how does this feel? How would you use it? Um, what circumstances uh, uh, does it bring? Uh, what sort of conversations does it bring? These sorts of things. Um, so we'll do the usual um, going around and having people introduce themselves. We'll ask a different question this time. So um, the question we'll ask is uh, introduce yourself and um, and uh, how much do you know about pattern language, and have you uh, come about it in a uh, come about a, come across it before, or have you uh, used it before? And I'll call out people. Um, I'll go around and randomly, I think, because um, I still have a strange interface. I can only see a few people at a time. Um, but let's see, Zad, say hi. Yeah, hello. Um... My name is Ad Khan. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a graduate from the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program. That's how I came to Systems Thinking Ontario. Um, regarding the question, uh, I am I'm not ultra familiar with pattern language, but I've heard of it and I've been learning alongside um, David Ng and some others that were working on some systems changes, and that's where. Um, I kind of heard about it and the Christopher Alexander work as well, but uh, I'm not, I don't have an advanced knowledge about it at all. But so that's in interesting to be here today. Thanks. Thanks, Ad. Gary? Yeah. Oh, hi. hi there. I'm uh, Gary Metcalf um, in Ashton, Kentucky. I heard about pattern language mostly when David got involved, I guess, a number of years ago and, you know, didn't really know an awful lot about it. But my current interest um, has come from recently running across pattern language as a part of permaculture. So my, my real interest at this point is um, trying to understand how pattern language fits into that in a way that the, the foundations of both permaculture and maybe the implications of pattern language can be applied to organizations as they're interested in sustainability. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Samia. Hi, um, this is Samia Hussain. I'm outside right now, so I cannot talk, but I was a student of OPAD University and that's how I got to know systems language and I'm Interested about it. Thanks. Uh, Robert, say hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm calling in from near Toronto in, in Markham. I guess uh, I was trying to think how I encountered pattern language. Likely the first time would have been somebody talking about the group works uh, pattern language deck and then. Um, uh, yeah, I think I more formally dove in after meeting David, and I think the first Systems Thinking Ontario meeting I went to was a presentation David gave on uh, pattern language and uh, Christopher Alexander's work. And uh, more recently, I've been exploring and playing with the Federated Wiki um, open source software project, which is pretty pretty explicitly about uh, being a tool for creating uh, pattern languages, though I should say I haven't played with creating patterns or full, full languages myself, but just sort of interested. Yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks, Robert. Elena, and I see Penelope there too. Hi, you want to go first? Hi, I'm Penelope Colville. I, um, <clears throat> I uh, have been a member of the American Society of Cybernetics since 1986, and I, most, I practice educational cybernetics. 
And um, I'm very interested to hear uh, your lecture on a pattern language. I've heard of it, but I don't think I know that much about it. Uh, and I'm Elena Leonard, also in Toronto. And I've uh, seen a couple of presentations. And I think what I'm most interested in is to see if there's any relationship between pattern language and discussions and the way that integration dialogue happens. Thanks, Elena. Uh, Natalia, yeah, hi. Hello, all. Um, I'm also based in Toronto on the banks of the Humber River. I uh, heard about Christopher Alexander's work back in undergrad uh, through my interest in architecture and the design of cities. Um, wouldn't know too much else beyond that. My connection to systems started with climate change and uh, interning with the ECCC, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. And um, that's about it for now. Thanks. Kirk, say hi. Hello. Um, yeah, I was building a house with an architect a few years ago. Um, and the architect was trained by Frank Lloyd Wright, went to Taliesin West. So I said to him, oh good, we're gonna, can we do the bubble thing? And he's like, no, we're not gonna do the bubble thing. And uh, you can imagine the competition between Christopher Alexander and Frank Lloyd Wright. So I, I was like, oh, put it in my place. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, I've read some of the first pattern book, uh, pretty amazing. It's kind of like a poem overlaying different patterns on top of each other. Seemed really powerful. Thanks, Kirk. Griff, say hi. Hey, everybody. I'm Griff, nice to meet you. I'm uh, coming out of uh, Waterloo in Guelph. Uh, and I think I first heard of um, patterns quite, quite a long time ago. I also had a few friends who built some houses uh, utilizing some of this, um, but more recently uh, through David and this group uh, and through Scrum as well, which is something I'm interested in. Thanks. Jim. Hello, everyone. Um, this is my first, first meeting, so good to be here. Um, I'm in my first year doing a PhD at the University of Waterloo in the School of uh, in social and ecological sustainability. Um, I don't know much about uh, pattern language, um, but I've uh, had an introduction in systems thinking from and complexity from Santa Fe. I did their online course, which was very interesting. And um, I'm, I'm working with crafts and skills livelihoods, and I'm interested in the stories that, that arise from, from them uh, and pra practitioners of them in um, informing new ideas about um, economic structures so be really really interesting to to see what's going on thanks it's really good by the way kelly say hi hey i'm kelly okamira i'm calling from downtown toronto um certainly i i've uh, got most of my reference to pattern language through uh working with david ing and uh did some really quick uh, um uh, a look on to to the, uh, the public site and went into a number of the different uh, pattern languages, uh, uh, patterns. Um, my original background is in visual communication. So I'm really interested in this in terms of um, doing work uh, or communicating for social good. I'm really looking Thanks. forward to it. Thanks, Kelly. Josh? Hi folks, uh, my name is Yosh um, or Yoshi. I go by he him pronouns. Um, I'm a grad student with uh, OCAD University in the Master of Design, Design for Health program with, um, I'm currently um, enrolled in the course with uh, Peter Jones in systems design thinking and whatnot. Um, so I'm happy to be here and I have um, very little awareness uh, or no awareness of uh, pattern uh, thinking. So I'm looking forward to learning more, thanks. Thanks. Carrie. Hi there, my name is Carrie. Um, I'm a current uh, student of the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. Um, similar to Yoshi, I'm under the direction of Peter Jones. Um, I did his, I'm still in his systems thinking and yeah, happy to, happy to learn more, happy to be here. Thanks. Christine? 
Hi, it's, uh, oh, my camera is not very good here. Um, it's Christine Martin, and I'm a recent grad from the SFI program, and I don't know a lot, but curious to learn more. Thanks. Uh, Bev. Oh, hi. I am actually currently in California, but I am uh, a student at OCAD and have just uh, finished a course with Peter Jones in um, same as Yosh and in the same class as him. And um, Pete has just instilled a real great interest in systems, systems learning. And um, I have no, no clue what patterns are, but I'm always happy to learn. So thanks. Thanks. Uh, Peter, say hi. All right. Um, I, I first um, uh, was, I guess, introduced to the, the magic of pattern languages through Jim Copleen, and uh, he's at AT&T Bell Labs, and it's transitioned to, was it Lumina or whatever it was in the 90s for, for a while? Uh, but it was, it was uh, there was the movement before Agile became really well known or well understood in the development of pattern languages for software engineering. And I'm, that's the world that I worked with. I worked with engineers and large platform design and we started looking at that approach and that led me to uh, Christopher Alexander's um, book, pa Pattern Language, which I just thought was, was beautiful and well-conceived. And then I found the permaculture people were using it a little later on, like uh, others have mentioned. And then I've put a couple of other references into um, um, one to one of Jim Copleen's books, but also to, I don't know what it is at the West Coast, uh, Doug, maybe you can tell us about this, but you know, I know Tom Atley from the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. He's, he, he, had, he was one of the contributors to the GroupWorks deck, which we started using in our, our design with dialogue and also in our OCAD training, it's, I use, the group work stack. In fact, I I used that deck with the design for health course that that uh, Beverly and Yoshi are in, and might might not have really emphasized that that was you were learning a pattern language, and we were exploring the group works cards out of, out of the group works deck. And so that was a Vancouver Seattle project, I think, yeah, or wherever Tom. I think he's Seattle, right? And then Tom also had recently developed the Wise Democracy pattern language, which Natalia also in the call had um, talked about um, with, uh, her, with her experience. I mean, that's her, that we had recently done a session with the Wise Democracy deck, well, I guess recently last year. Now, so we've been using these tools and, uh, and, and, and actually Doug, I know your book for, and had used it in our first term at uh, the OCAD's, uh, OCAD University's Strategic Foresight and Innovation course as one of the research methods books um, in our first year, figuring out which book was going to work well with our students. And, and our students really, it was a, a Liberating Voices, it's an excellent book for the type of social design that a number of our students are interested in. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Joanne, say hi. Hi, Joanne from uh, Toronto suburb, Richmond Hill. Um, I am familiar with the pattern language from a technology software development perspective. I've uh, developed software patterns while working for IBM Canada as a technology and systems architect. And I've attempted uh, to design patterns to solve uh, systems interoperability problems in the past. And I, because of that, that led me to uh, Christopher Alexander's books several years ago, I think in 2014. So I've actually read both of his uh, Timeless Ways of Building and uh, a Pattern uh, Language. So I'm curious to find out uh, what um, um, Douglas uh, will be sharing with us today from a, a complex a systems perspective. Thanks. Dan, say hi. Hi, oops. Hi, I'm Dan Ng from Toronto. Uh, as far as my first exposure to pattern language, okay, so I have to tell a quick story. I was sitting in a system Ontario meeting. I think we were at 192 Spadina and David comes into the meeting there with like his knapsack full of these books on pattern languages. 
I think they were about pattern language. He throws out his the knapsack, the books all fall on the table. I'm going, okay, so that's good. And I discovered that, uh, you know, this whole Chris Alexander thing was is quite the deal because here's a guy that was doing like buildings and suddenly we're using patterns in software development, as uh, Joanne said. So that was really a big uh, sort of a aha moment for me. And the other thing is that uh, I was caught off guard the other day. David said, you know, patterns are different than pattern languages, right? I said, no. So there you have it, my sum total of everything I know about pattern languages. Thank you and hope you guys, oh, one last thing. I'm going to challenge Douglas Schuler to our speaker today to kind of relate uh, toys on the ground with patterns. So this is a very big, big topic for me. I gotta see how he does that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and uh, right before Doug, so I'm David Ng. Uh, the way I came through pattern language was that uh, at IBM, um, in effect, I was doing a lot of methodology work and the IBM Global Services method was pattern language. I also ended up working with IBM Research and uh, my colleague uh, Ian Simmons had said, oh, I'm working with the world's best programmer. And I go, how can you possibly say that? And he says, I'm working with John Blasides. And John Blasides is one of the original authors of um, the uh, Design Patterns book, which is the so-called Gang of Four book. So I said to Ian, oh, maybe you're right. You do, maybe you do have one of the world's best programmers working with you. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been, uh, since 2014, uh, I went to uh, the PLOP conference, the Pattern Languages of Programming conference, uh, the Purple Sock conference, uh, the, which is in Europe, um, which is the Pattern Languages um, in, for Social Change, uh, the Pearl Conference, which is the architecture conference out of the Portland Urban Research Lab, uh, Asian Plop. So I've been to pretty well all of them. And uh, Doug and I have met. Uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Peter will appreciate is that uh, since Doug's in Seattle, I'm in Toronto, the question was, well, are we ever going to meet? And, uh, it's, and when I finally got around to it, uh, he was headed for Shanghai. And it's kind of like, oh, well, I'm going to be there. And so uh, we ended up meeting in Shanghai, touring around a little bit. And, um, and uh, for Peter's benefit, uh, we have a photo of him, me, and Susu um, eating vegetarian Chinese food, I think. So anyway, um, so with this, I'm going to uh, briefly stop the share and invite Doug um, to, um, uh, to uh, introduce yourself. And I guess... Doug, um, we, we can do more of a conversation to start off with, but I guess the is how, um, how did you come to Pattern Language and uh, what's the story behind this public sphere project? Well, boy, I, I, uh, I, rem I remember being in, uh, when I was still teaching and sometimes we'd go around in the class and everybody would say what they're interested in. And I was always just sort of bowled over because there's so many different interesting perspectives and, and sort of they're all in one place. And you think there's, there's some immense kind of possibility just sitting in, the, in one room, you know, and, and I had the same thought uh, then and I'm hoping to get to a lot of those the comments and questions before, but uh, when I was, uh, I, I remember like the first moment I, I found out about the, the pattern language, uh, work. I was, uh, my last year at this school, Evergreen, which I ultimately taught at for 21 years, it's kind of an alternative school uh, south of Seattle. And it, it has, a, it's all, it's very interdisciplinary and there's no grades and there are no required courses. And uh, it's, you know, it's certified and, and whatever, it's, it's fine as a degree granting institution, but it's kind of interesting to get uh, cut a deal with the creditor, the, cre the credentialing or whatever committees, uh, because we have to sh show how the graduates got through and got an education. And so we do it with written evaluations, uh, which was a real pain, but, but uh, I think really good for learning. But anyway, my, the program that I took at Evergreen was called Toward Humane Technospheres, which is kind of a strange name. But uh, I, in fact, that last, that last year I was at Evergreen, I lived in this shack 
that uh, that this friend of mine had land close to school. So I said, you know, can I build a, a well, I don't want to make a long, too long a story out of it, but uh, I asked if I could build my little uh, shed or shack there, this 12 by 12. And my friends and I put it up in an afternoon. I stayed there in a year, just banging it together sort of haphazardly. But uh, I, was, I was there and my professor uh, of the Toward Humane Technospheres, he had us reading uh, Alexander's book. And uh, I thought this is like the, the coolest thing. And I guess it stuck with me that, that you could write a pattern language about anything. And this is what, this is like on page three of, uh, uh, of his book and uh, of the pattern language book. And it must have stuck with me because then, you know, forward on, you know, 20 some years, I was organizing a conference uh, for computer professionals for social responsibility. And it was pretty open-ended for people that were doing kind of civic technology and uh, community radio and, and some of the uh, community networks, things that were happening before, you know, Amazon and Google came in and just, you know, outspent everybody a thousand dollars to one. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, I remember reading about, oh, and so I, a friend of mine said, you're so hep on the patterns, why don't you have a call for patterns instead of a call for papers? And, and we got like over a hundred different pattern proposals, pattern proposals. And so those ultimately morphed you know by one way or another into into my book and and you know i don't know how many of those original pattern proposals actually made it in i i, I don't know if i ever counted but maybe maybe a a quarter maybe i don't think a half maybe a third but um uh, and so that was that was the sort of the the origins of why I've become interested in pattern languages, but also how how the liberating voices pattern language came about. And we hadn't even thought of a book or anything when the, um, when we were organizing that conference. And then all of a sudden, we saw that we had so many cool ideas that were all the way from the uh, sort of intellectual, very high theory sort of stuff to uh, kind of more precise, very uh, specific ways of uh, organizing. And uh, anyway, so we, then we just took that that sort of raw material and just kept work with, working with the different authors. Ultimately, there were like 85 authors in the book. Um, so we sort of crowdsourced it. You know, I don't know how many years before the word crowdsourced came along, but, but that's, that's the way we, we did it. Um, yeah, and, and so I guess then the evolution of the book has been uh, how, how, how do we use it? And then, uh, uh, I mean, I could, we can get to this, these things later, but, but how do you use it and, and what kind of impact can it actually ultimately have how can we squeeze as much value out of it as as we think is is possible to squeeze, um, and and so that's kind of my latest sort of uh, obsession is trying to get uh, trying to imagine how this pattern community writ large could be actually provide as much value as possible in, in, in dealing with these problems that we that we're faced with. And I think there's there's really uh, a strong potential match between the, the types of problems that we have, climate change, et cetera, and and this sort of pattern language 
a, approach. Uh, I don't, I, I consider it more, you know, if it's going to be opened up, you want to be able to accommodate all the different versions. I think we're all in this, in the sort of the spirit of, of Christopher Alexander without necessarily being, uh, taking, taking his work as absolute truth stricture, uh, uh, you know, very sort of doctrinaire uh, discipline, open, open it up. Uh, uh, yeah, let's, um, let's, yeah. let's play, let's play a little game here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen again. Um, and we have all the patterns. And so um, someone put into the chat which one of these patterns you'd like to discuss because we can dive into them and then we can get a feel maybe we'll do like maybe two or three of these so whoever puts the first in the chat just yell out civic intelligence okay okay doug can you kind of step us through um what we have here and yeah and sure works? i'd be happy to the top part uh before the picture, it's got all these different tags. We haven't used those tags much, but all the patterns are are tagged. And um, and if there were if there was some sort of repository where lots of different patterns could be uh, involved, they could be tagged in some way like this. But but so civic intelligence. This is uh, I was kind of the you know there's different ways of pulling this collaboration together. I was, I wouldn't say I was a tyrant, but I was the person that was, uh, I don't know, the, the last word, you know. Uh, we didn't have big arguments or anything. Anyway, but, but, but uh, civic intelligence, we organized these things. Uh, we played around with different ways of organizing uh, this whole big pile of patterns that we wanted to assemble into one pattern language. And uh, finally, we ultimately just decided we would do it like Alexander did it. You start with the broadest, the most general, and then you work through kind of to the most specific. And so uh, uh, the civic intelligence, I thought was kind of the, the broadest, uh, maybe, maybe the most important, maybe just one of them, but, but everything that, that we were doing, we want to do every project, you want to really leave the civic intelligence higher. I'm not interested in things that, that turn over all the problems to a computer. I, I think that we're not at that point yet and anybody that, anyway, we're not at that point yet. So, so just civic intelligence is, is basically how smart groups of people are and societies are in uh, in addressing their the problems that, that face them, uh, if you look over on the right, it says English, Arabic, Chinese, French. Uh, we uh, we have we have a pattern card for each each of the patterns. This is what you're seeing now is the text that's that's online, but it's also in the in the book, and so. But then we came up with the idea of cards, and uh, I did see the French. What happened to it? Oh, oh, it automatically translated it for you. Dude. Oh, I have to turn off the, uh, the automatic translate on this thing. So sorry, it was in French. Just Google, Google decided we should read it in English. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, let me try that again. Okay, French. Yeah, so, well, it's did it again. Oh, no, it's back. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, some languages we have uh, uh, just this is the card version. So, this is what's on a physical card that we use in, in workshops. And uh, and so, it's just, it's just a short form, uh, very short form of the, of the pattern. And it's not divided into problem, solution, discussion, et cetera, like, like the sort of long form. But uh, 
but I have all, we have all the cards, I mean, all the patterns in the, in the Liberating Voices pattern language translated into, uh, we have a whole set in, I think, no, I don't think French, uh, Arabic, Chinese, Spanish, Vietnamese. Yeah, I guess so there's, there's five full decks. Um, and, but then we have a lot of other things like Korean, I think we only have like two. Russian, we have maybe 15. Um, and so if anybody ever, uh, we just, in fact, Japanese isn't here, but at one of these conferences, these uh, uh, Japanese people that are very interested in pattern languages said, oh, we would like to translate. And they just wrote to me yesterday and they said, they have all the patterns uh, uh, translated that are that are used in our activist mirror game, and I think that might be worth showing. But but so anyway, this is this is this civic intelligence is divided up in this kind of more or less the same things as um, Alexander's. Ours is different. We have the problem, the context, the discussion. In Alexander's book, context only points to other patterns in the pattern, uh, in, in the pattern language. And ours, we have a context that's actually the context where this thing would be used. And then if you scroll up, David, the, um, or back to the top, uh, all of these are similar to his, uh, his what they call a context. And each, each one of these, um, like often if you'd use the civic intelligence pattern, you might use social dominance attenuation, you might use global citizenship. Um, and so we tried to kind of come up with a rich kind of a network of how the patterns were related to each other. We learned a lot, like, you know, I would say almost any two patterns in the liberating voices things you could use together. And, um, with the Alexander's things, you know, some are just about a room or they're just about a building. And so if you're building a room, you might not care about independent regions or sleeping in public or uh, some of them. So, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know what else, this is, this is one of the patterns, let's, uh, Let's try uh, another one. Yeah, let's go with another one. Uh, okay, so we had a request after that for the commons. Okay, well, the commons is very, you know, uh, it's interesting that that we did these, the first three are, I, I really think they're, they're, they do offer some sort of a summary of, of the whole thing. And the commons, is, you know, there's another, in fact, there's another pattern language that just came out on, on the commons. And so one of the things that we've always said is that these, these are things are sort of fractal. You could, you could take the commons and make a pattern language out of it, and somebody did. But this is just basically trying to say that really we have to govern ourselves as a commons because we're not in it by ourselves. And so uh, this is talking about different different ways to to bring about um, thinking about commons and, and trying to do things with it. Um, and this is done by a, a, I would say a commons scholar, this David Bollier, he's been working in the field for a very long time. Um, and so he put this together. It's a You know, it, I guess the, the the main threats to the commons would probably be corporations, uh, you know, uh, banditry, big uh, the corrupt officials. Um, uh, you know, I didn't really mention it, but one of the reasons that that I kind of wanted to do this, one of the things that I one of my critiques when I first read this in the 70s was that it really it doesn't it doesn't acknowledge 
all the heat that you're going to get when you try to do something that's that's against the uh, the regular way of doing business. And so there wasn't anything about uh, politics or negotiation or you know. Um, but anyway, so that's that, that's that's the commons. Uh, you can tell a lot if you just look at the uh, the pattern card uh, too. It's interesting. I I met the the guy. This is sort of not even germane, but uh, the guy that started Oddwalla, the fruit juice company. Have you ever, I don't know if you've heard of that, but I showed him my book, and he said you should do cards. And I went cards. We just did a five hundred and some page book. Now you're telling me you want you know one paragraph. But anyway, I, it was a great idea, and I knew, and it, and and so we. We did those uh, workshops. In fact, I um, the day before the David and I went around Shanghai, uh, I did a workshop in at the uh, incubation hub Shanghai, and it was great because we had a full deck of the of the patterns in English, and we had a full deck in uh, uh, Mandarin Chinese, and um, so anyway, so it was kind of interesting to have the sort of the dual language workshop. That was the first time we had done that. So that's the, I guess the commons. Um, any others that kind of strike your fancy that are farther down in the list maybe? The mystification and re-enchantment one that's requested. This, okay, I mean, this is one of my this is kind of one of my favorites, and I we didn't know where to put it exactly, but um, it's it's probably it's arguably the most open-ended of them all, but but basically it was saying, kind of suggesting that we need to be rethinking a little bit of what what we call sacred and what we're considering, uh, you know, so so. People sort of treat technology like it's it's delivered from the gods, and and so, you know, I like to say, well, this is the way it's this is the way it's done. It's not smoke and mirrors. This is, you know, we've got these servers and we've got this, you know. So you 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 demystify technology, but then you you try also to put the enchantment back in things like life and art and and being together. And um, you know, just sort of a, I don't know, maybe this gets back to the uh, the toys all over the floor that, that, that somebody was asking me about that I didn't put them there, but my three-year-old uh, grandson did. And, and I, there's some sort of enchantment going on and it's just like, just a uh, joy to, to watch. And uh, I can hear him in the background because, anyway, he, he's came, he's over today. He's letting us do this, I guess. Um, but anyway, so that's the re the the, de the demystification is is sort of taking the mystery out of things that shouldn't be mysterious, like technology, and and putting the enchantment back. Uh, I got it from this book called Reenchanting Art, and. Uh, this, this, uh, the author was saying, you know, instructing people in how to do art or encouraging them, that's a form of art in itself. And, uh, and, and just, I like the idea of just sort of trying to re-enchant things. Um, so this is kind of a, our one mystery uh, wild card card. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share because we've gotten people a little bit of flavor of this. And so yeah. I'm not sure if uh, I've asked for questions and people can uh, can type into the chat and ask yeah. questions or just give impressions. Um, anyone? You know, I can just throw in that, that uh, Kelly was asking about dumbing down and one of my students um, right in the middle of something else sort of jumped up and said, we have got to do anti-patterns. And so 
uh, I thought that's a terrible idea. And why are you, you know, you're supposed to write them in a positive light. And, and, uh, and then the, the, everybody in the class goes, yeah, yeah, we, we have to do that. And so then the next quarter, because it was everywhere I could pull it off, we, we, spent, we spent the time coming up with a, a set of anti-patterns. And it's kind of a, the, the problematic in some ways. And, and so, so that was a school project uh, that sort of was a byproduct of the, of the whole pattern language. And it's, I thought it was very kind of valuable and, and, uh, and really, I think we're making a big mistake when we don't sort of acknowledge sort of the dark side. I mean, the, the US was just about brought down six months ago. Oh, what QAnon, what Trump, what, I mean, this is a political thing, I know, but uh, this, is, this is part of, a, of waking up. Uh, we don't assume that these things are done in some for a vacuum when there aren't people that really want to undo everything you want to do. And I, I don't want to, and I don't want to use their weapons. I mean, I don't really want to use weapons at all, but uh, not ones that are, are physical. Uh, but anyway, so I, I think that the dumbing down the, the uh, you know, and, and the pattern languages themselves do have this problematic uh, woven into them because they, each one has a problem statement, but it's not, it, it's, it's distributed all around, I don't know. But that was, that was an interesting thing. But, but yeah, I'll let somebody ask a question or make okay. a comment. Bev, would you like to make a comment? No, I, I just think my little uh, question asks it. <laughs> um, I do love the demystification and reenchantment, it, and it just, as you explained it, it just was really quite mind opening. But I'd like to know your process in developing it, um, uh, how the ideas came, and then if you've seen this particular one used, and I see another question below, or others used and their application in community or in organizational settings. I, uh, I mean, in, in a general way, I, my mind has always sort of rebelled against the, the people trying to get the one ring or the one thing that sums it all up when I, I just have never seen one thing do it all. And, and if it does, then it's at a level that we can't use. Like, oh, e equals E equals MC squared. I guess you can use it if you're gonna make a nuclear weapon, but um, any, so I'm interested in kind of the, the holism that, that, that the patterns can sort of provide uh, and, and I just in my, I guess in my mind, I've always been, you know, I, I don't, you know, the, I guess with that demystification, it, it was sort of the, with computer professionals for social responsible, we wanted to just demystify computers and not let people think, oh, they never make a mistake. And, oh, AI, that's going to be smarter than anybody else. And plus it's going to be wise and fair and just and, what is this a god you're talking about or what is this i thought it was just a computer over here uh and then the re-enchantment came from from the book but i have to say that you know sometimes i'll hear a presentation and i can sort of jot down five or six patterns that people are using um but but they, I would say they are using the pattern, but they have never consulted, as far as I know, my book. Uh, and so I don't, I don't really have a success story for, um, for these necessarily. Plus, so, so there's, somebody could come up to me and say, oh, we used your demystification and re-enchantment pattern and it was great. 
you know, we came up with a very successful project. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know of them. And there's no mechanism for me to necessarily find out. Uh, I know the ones we've used in class, uh, you know, like there's activist road trip uh, in the, um, uh, in the book. And, and one of my students said, we have to go on an activist road trip. And so ever since then, we went on at least one activist road trip a year for the last eight or so years while I was teaching at Evergreen. And also this, this thing that we did at Incuba, in, Incubation Hub Shanghai, my students from Shanghai, uh, this Sh Xing Wei uh, College, they came and this was our activist road trip. I said, should we go on an activist road trip? They goes, yes, we wanna go on an activist road trip. And so we went. Um, Part of the part of this sort of big dream that I have, and I sent David a copy of this paper that shows what we're we're trying to pull off this sort of vision. It would have more of this mechanism feedback thing built in. Um, somebody say the pattern. There's a pattern, and it exists online, and you read it, and you say. Well, we tried this and this is what we did and it didn't really work because maybe this. And so they comment on it. Somebody else comes along, they want to use that pattern. They look at it and they said, oh, here's what these other people said about it. So uh, it's to think of it more as a uh, locus for for communication. Um, exactly. That, bring this, that, we would that like. brings it. That brings us to Jim's question. Jim, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, yes, thanks um, very much. The question was just, can anyone create an, and submit a new pattern? Well, the way our, the way our system is, is the, the one that we have now, um, not at the labs, just at www.publicsphereproject.org, that anybody that has an account can add a new pattern. And so they're not necessarily adding it to the liberating voices. In fact, they're not. I mean, it's because we've got, there's a, there's a, a tag. Uh, and so within that system, we have those anti-patterns. We've got one, one, one year I taught with a, a woman who's, all, who's a, uh, she's a medical doctor, but also she's a, a, a master's in public health person too. And so she said, we need, we'll, we'll do a, so we did, our program was called, oh, public, public thinking and public health. And so the civic intelligence and the public health stuff came together. And we and the students made up a, a public thinking and public health pattern language. And so that's, that's resides on our on our site also all these translations are there and uh one of the problems is that when they changed they upgraded or whatever drupal to like this new version we never really made the transition because we didn't know we don't have the the programmers to to do it so it's it's not as trivial as just going in i still know how to give people accounts on our system but it's not the way it should be, you know. But but yeah, anybody can anybody can do it. It's it's an interesting. Um, that's I would like. That's part of this vision is to have these different pattern things come together, and uh, one of the the things is, for example, say you're a big fan of Christopher Alexander's stuff. I mean, I am and other people are. And so you never, you say, what patterns did you use in your house? You don't say, I used all 253 of them. Nobody used, you know, you, you, you don't, you use a subset. And so why wouldn't you use the subset of Alexander stuff if you were building, use the group works people to see negotiate, say you're, say you're working together as there's a team, uh, you're a consulting group and you want to 
have a new office and, and a, you want to have a retreat center. I don't know. And so you bring in Alexander stuff. You might bring in something from Liberating Voices, the enchantment. Uh, I mean, re-enchantment. And, and so there's no, the, the way I see it, there's no law that says you have to only use from one, one system, you know, one language. And that's where I respect the idea of a language where, where there's all these things are grouped together around a single domain, but life and knowledge, et cetera, don't really work that way. And so uh, we might as well let people mix and match. Uh, and so- Yeah, that, that may lead yeah. us actually towards Gary's question. Gary? Yeah, thanks. Um, so just to understand, I, I, I don't know where you can see me or if you can, but anyway, um, so would, would you describe the focus of your work as being primarily identifying the patterns more than necessarily using patterns um, in, in a more applied way? I mean, you are taking like a, a consulting practice and going into places and having people use them, you're really identifying patterns and then people are taking them themselves and, you know, understanding them, learning them, designing their own. Is that the way you describe the focus of, of what you've been working on? Well, that might be what I have been doing, but it's, it's never been my, I don't know about never, but it's not my, it's not my focus. It's not what I, what I want, want to do. In fact, okay. that's one of my critiques with the whole pattern language community is it's been so focused. It seems seems to me, and and I don't I don't really want to claim that I know the whole thing, but there's all this focus on writing a pattern language and putting something together, and there's been seems to be less of a focus on on how do you use these, and uh, and so really right now, in fact, this Opus Magnum thing that I that uh, I would share with anybody that, that wants to see it because we're looking for reviews desperately. Um, David has a copy, but I want these things to be as useful and as accessible as possible and think, why aren't people using them? I mean, in the architecture thing, uh, the architecture world, because I've, I've, gone, I've gone to this Pearl conference lots of times and they're always, very accepting. They 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 welcome. You know, I've been got to present their various aspects. I presented on the anti patterns. And, you know, so they they want to open up, even though it's still primarily architecture. But uh, they say, why is like the new? Oh, I forget now what it's called. The does any you know anybody know about that? It's a seaside planned community, the new new urbanism, I think it's called. There's this there's this trend or uh, movement in in architecture called new new urbanism, and you know the, some of these architects say, why isn't why aren't we as popular as them? And I think, yeah, I don't you know I don't really know. I'd I'd like to like to help you figure it out because. Uh, you know, I think we've got some really strong things to 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 offer, and uh, but I don't think I don't think we're anywhere near the sort of the potential that that we could have. And you were looking at the permaculture, right, Gary? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I've had some students that were interested, and there's these people did do a whole permaculture pattern language too. I've seen that. And, and it seems like if you're talking about any sort of large scale concept where there's that that's, that's not simple, mm -hmm. you know, where it actually is, is complicated, then, then that's a good place for a pattern language. And so I was really happy to see the permaculture and there's the new towns people, I think, in their transition towns, it's called, something like that. They're, uh, in England, it's, it's bigger. Uh, 
they came up with a pattern language. There's people doing mutual aid pattern language and they're, um, I think kind of in your backyard. I think they're in North Carolina. Is that where you were, Gary? Or? In Kentucky, but it's close. Kentucky. Okay. Yeah. Close enough. No, yeah. no. But anyway, so um, they're doing mutual aid and, and all these things are very interesting. And I, I really don't know how to uh, squeeze all the value out of it, but, but I'm certainly uh, pushing it. You know, I, I, I think it's a good sort of a, uh, have a Green New Deal article that I, if I can do it, I'll put up the link there, but it was a, trying to make kind of a very, very draft version of what a Green, green New Deal pattern language might look like because you know, Korea's doing a Green New Deal. And I mean, it's, it, the concept is, is traveling and people feel the urgency of really getting, getting the job done, you know, of uh, uh, dealing with, with climate change without necessarily throwing a few communities out into the ocean and say, well, we had, to, you know, you got to throw them away because then we could do better for ourselves or, uh, and and so I don't know where I was going exactly with that, but but one of the things I think that we could be doing is is having sort of crowdsourcing, if you would, if you were, uh, pattern languages that actually could could help bridge the the uh, help bring these communities together. I mean. You know, government is working on climate change, but but so are some local businesses and some some community groups want to help figure this out. And and you know, Black Lives Matter is there? Is, is does that factor into it? I I sort of think it does. I, this you know, if it, it's all about how ultimately how we're how we are managing ourselves, yeah, or not. You know. just, a, just a quick follow-up question, then I'm going to get off and let other people um, get in. But I, I wonder if it would be feasible or useful to, to work at identifying some of the patterns that have actually caught traction. In other words, you know, why, why the particular seaside kind of um, you know, new design caught on as opposed to the others? You know, why, why are we not living in Bucky Fuller geodomes? You know, really good ideas, but they just didn't catch the traction. So identifying the things that really did catch on, I wonder if there's a place yeah. to, to look for those. Yeah, I mean, I do think that part of it is probably just, I mean, this new, the new urbanism is kind of a, I don't know if, I, I hope there's no fans in it, but it, it's sort of like what what you might like like it's, it's, it's like yuppie architecture, kind of. I mean, it, it looks like it's sort of homespun, but it's all sort of canned. And and yeah. Disney was one of the big investors in it. So, okay. you know, I don't want to say it was, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an architect, but, and also I do think that there's there's fads. And if, and if you're not along with the fad, the, the way things are going at the moment, uh, you know, we were trying to do these community networks, you know, com computer community networks back in the 80s. And that was at the high water mark of sort of libertarianism. And people were saying, no, you don't, you don't want to do things. That's the collective. You know, you don't want to do things a community. We, it's all individual and, and companies and yeah, you got to make money off of everything. And we go, well, yeah. and you know, now if maybe if the computer stuff was coming along, there'd be more of a, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I think that's a good challenge. And it'd be interesting to get these architects together and say, why are they being more successful? And I do think that, that people haven't heard about the pattern languages so much. And then, it, then some people are just mystified when they look at it too. You know, some people just eat it up. It's just like this is oh, this is the best thing I've ever seen. But 
but a lot of people go, what? I don't understand. What's a pattern? And uh, and to me, I want I do want to demystify it and say it's just it's I don't want to say it, it's not a recipe, but it's just it's just kind of a concept that that you can use if you want. You know. Um, let's let's move on to I, Peter. Yeah. And he, you've got Peter. You've got two questions. Combine them into one, or however you want to handle it. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, it's not a burning question. Um, what was it about uh, anti-patterns or whether those could be shadow patterns that are that as we yeah. as we identify them um, in practice, they could be opportunities for for interacting with with people who are kind of caught up in those patterns. And we see a lot of dark pattern and in interaction you know, patterns in interaction design, information yeah. behavior. And when we identify these, you know, there, there might be ways to intervene and to flip them to the, you know, to the bright, shiny pattern that it's actually kind of a flip side of. So the behaviors might not need to change so much as the value of how that behavior is being used. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I don't know sort of the best way to represent them. I mean, I really thought that that coming up with the way you think things ought to be is the good way to organize a book. You don't want, well, this is the way you think it ought to be. And then, oh, don't do it this way. Oh, do the, you know, the, the consistency, I think, is part of the beauty of, of, the, of, the, of the pattern languages. But, but then you kind of you sort of lose, I don't know if you lose it necessarily, but, but how's the best way hmm. to portray the, uh, the, the stuff that's trying to make it, you know, the, that's pushing it one way. We're, what we're trying to do is just sort of divert, you know, uh, you could do it this way, this way, or this way, but we would, maybe you want to go that way. And they go, oh, okay. And then if enough people are going that way over another way. Oh, well, that's the key. You've got to get those people identifying the patterns and being able to communicate together around them. And okay. so we're all kind of talking to the same kind of friendly faces all the time. Yeah. So how, how do we get, is, are there ways to get beyond that? If, there, if we actually, so one, one of the ways that, that I teach uh, system dynamics and causal loops and which are often, you know, they, they look like engineering diagrams to people at first and everything. And the way that we approach this, that I approach learning um, system dynamics models and the kind of behavioral loops that, that demonstrate problems within systems is to use, you know, what are called the archetypes. So these are like success to the successful, which is like the rich keep getting richer. And there's a pattern for that. Yeah. And fixes that fail, which is that we try to, we underestimate what it's going to take to you know to address a problematic situation and we address the symptom and not the underlying problem so would we right. you yeah. know there there's you know tragedy of the commons uh, uh, shifting the burden these have colorful names and, and and once we can identify those we know kind of how to intervene and, and until we have a name for it we don't know sometimes what we're dealing with or we can say the rich are getting richer but what if we flip that, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, um, well, it isn't always flipping to the other pattern because rich getting richer wouldn't be success successful. You can't just flip that to a downward spiral, which is the same pattern in the other direction. You have to have ways to intervene, but some of them do call into mind, like the, the pattern could be the reverse, the fixes the fail, you deal with the underlying problem instead of you know this is instead of the symptom yeah. so you start to identify where's the best way to introduce the pattern or to address the failure of of patterns i mean because we see that with nudges like in behavioral conditioning used in in and in, in policy unfortunately i have to say policy design because this is a thing in design now is designing policies using kind of the, the, the Sunstein nudging kind of philosophy. And when you really look at that closely, it becomes kind of a dark pattern. Maybe we don't all want to be nudged. Maybe we'd like to be aware of what's being asked and have some choice. And 
So when we become aware of what patterns are being used, that's just my thought is that, you know, maybe it's like a different addendum to the book now here. If you see these patterns, use use the shadow patterns, use these other ones to address them. Yeah, well, I totally, I mean, I've, I've been sort of harping on the, the if, you, if the thing doesn't have a name, you can't talk about it or even maybe think about it. And so um, that's one of the reasons I've been pushing this civic intelligence because it's not collective intelligence. Uh, it's a it's a type of collective intelligence, but why would we assume that collective intelligence would be done for the for good? You know, I I, I was just reading a thing today. Uh, the U.S. Special Forces were were doing a like a, a redesign so they can have more innovative sorties, and I thought, mm, well, geez, I mean maybe sometimes that's a good idea I don't know but uh it, it wasn't where I would the first place I would want to be focusing um but so do these things have a, you know you were saying the rich get richer I mean maybe that is the name of that sort of because if that'd be a, <coughs> excuse me that'd be an interesting deck of cards these all these different little things that are goof tricking us up all the time. Um, I mean, I guess they're anti-pattern. Or, yeah. Well, see, the systems people, I don't know <laughs> if others agree with this, but I just, my observation, because we teach um, systems thinking and systemic design course, we also teach, uh, I don't teach it, but I work with these methods, strategic foresight or futures thinking. <laughs> Oh, Peter, we, you're, you're, you're breaking up, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering. Quite optimistic, or at least driven by, it's going to be at least one dark scenario. One dark scenario, at least, but the general trend is, is optimistic. Systems thinking tends to be problem, you know, identifying problematics and addressing underlying symptoms. It, it's, it can be pessimistic because we start seeing the underbelly of how things actually work. Mm -hmm. and, and so it leads to a more critical viewpoint on things and trying to address fundamental system change, which may lead to positive outcomes, but we don't use always just positive uh, thinking to get there. We often, you know, use, Sure. we, we look for the critical patterns and try to f intervene in those and, and transform them. Yeah. It makes you Let's, look critical a lot though. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna move us along because our list of people who ask, might ask questions is getting longer. So Kelly had asked a few different questions. Kelly, do you have something you'd like to comment or ask? Uh, do we lose Kelly? No, I just couldn't get off mute. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Kelly. Okay, so my my most pressing question is related to the visuals and who who chooses the visuals, because I think that you had just said something with regards to uh, if you don't have a word, you can't um, you you can't have a dialogue. Um, Dan, you might want to jump in here with me to clarify, but you know we're working with a colleague in Amsterdam with re, uh, with regards to words. And I believe that he said that, you know, when we hear a word, we get a visual image in our, our mind and we're able to act upon from that. So, so that, that, that's my general question to you. Well, basically with, with, the, with the visuals in, in our, uh, in the liberating voices pattern language, uh, I asked people if they, if they came up with, uh, if they had some ideas of what they thought would be good. Um, I, I'm interested in visual stuff, but I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing uh, really. And, um, and so basically I, with ours, I saw kind of a, I don't know what they 
maybe in the movies it's called a, a palette, maybe. But but like with ours, we decided not to use cartoon images, and I think people use cartoon images because then they can. It's not copyright, or they're not worrying about stealing copyright. So anyway, all of all of ours had to be in the public domain, and they had to be shareable. Uh, I was kind of partial to using paintings in a lot of situations, and I, I don't think it maybe travels that well. Uh, but you know, we used the Duchamp. The, the the large glass or the I forget what it's called for for one of them and uh, I, I saw the gleaners uh, yeah the and the gleaners, gleaners is, is to, there to uh, uh, Gritta so it, it seemed like it cer certainly had a range in terms of it wasn't static or something that was fairly current yeah and and like I say I'm I'm kind of old school I never thought I would say that but I'm here you know now I'm almost 70 and so the things that I thought were kind of cool I don't know how cool they were um one thing that we that when the with the languages when when you make a another translation of of one of them and the, the you can change the image you can change the image and make it more context relevant which I I think is a big plus it's interesting when I was doing the the workshop in Shang, Shanghai, the um, the fact that at that point all of, all the patterns, no matter what language, did have the same image on them. So I could I could look down at the table, and if the Chinese people were were using it, I knew what patterns they were using, and so th that was kind of a, an unexpected plus. Um, I certainly wouldn't insist on it, you know, if if something was going to be used you know in china there's no reason to save the image just because doug likes it <laughs> but uh but so you know i've i've always thought that it would be really great if if there was really somebody handling the image thing you know uh the, vi the visuality um because you know, uh, my my vision of what they should be is not necessarily the best. I mean, neither is it the best in terms of the of the verbiage. Um, I had a student that said, "You need to translate the cards into everyday everyday language." You know, they sound like they're too you know, uh, academic and that sort of thing. And uh, I think the person's right. Uh, one person said, you ought to translate those so my kindergartner could use them, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. I mean, I, I love the concept, you know, I don't know, they wouldn't, I don't think you could translate them one, one to one, but, uh, You know, I think giving people ideas without telling them what to do is is a good thing, and that's what that's at the core what the, the patterns are supposed to do. Uh, the guy that translated them into Arabic said, "I'd like to translate these into street Arabic." You know, and I hadn't, you know, to me Arabic was Arabic. I never really thought about it. oh, you got street Arabic and then you got the academic Arabic. Of course you do. You know, why why would that language not be like other languages in some ways and um but yeah i think i think that's the it's really the visuals are very important and and i don't know i was disappointed that the, that they wouldn't let me put a visual in for every pattern in the book because alexander's book you could just flip through it and you go, wow, that is one cool photo. That is another cool photo. And and uh, it was a bit of a bait and switch. They they, they said I could in the beginning. And, and uh, when I got right down to it, they said, no, nah, it's kind of a hassle for us. 
but yeah, so I don't, I, I just, I don't know if I was answering any questions specifically, but that's, uh, um, you know, one. Let, let, let's move yeah. on to, uh, yeah, to let, Stephen. Let's, okay. Stephen? Okay, thanks very much. Sure, thank you. Oh, hi there. Yeah, Douglas, I was just wondering, sort of like Peter was saying, you know how you have these kind of contextual pieces, like where things, you know, how much can things change or not change? Like I was wondering how scale plays into it, you know, because you've got, um, like, I find often things get pushed into one scale or one context, you know, maybe how can I facilitate a workshop and then I'm facilitating the workshop. So I know I've got a group, I've got me, it's still complex, so it's good. Um, or maybe, you know, you're building a house. So it's, you've got some container on it. When things start to move between scales, I'm wondering sometimes whether you need some, like an, an extra parameter, maybe um, the quality of the space, the quality of the scale in combination with the pattern um, or the nature of the systems and systems that are being combined. Is it, you know, is it, is it a system which is, you know, in one location or have you got more than one location? And then does that need to be an extra parameter that goes with the pattern language card or something like that? Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are. Right. Well, it's interesting because I, I mean, I think that that question is really super relevant for the patterns that we came up with, and it's they're less relevant with the patterns that Alexander came up with because those are intended to be used to build a building. You know, basically, I mean, some of them are are not, but but a lot of them are 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 pretty practical. And when you have something like civic intelligence, uh, it's, it, it is applicable at so many different scales. One person can, can be sort of an agent of civic intelligence. A group could be, you could talk about an entire city or region, uh, country, the planet. You know, you can, you can talk about it in, in, in many ways. And you can use the pattern in different ways too. You could use the pattern we're going to do a, a, a poster campaign where we're going to, where we're going to focus on civic intelligence. Um, you could say, I'm going to start an organization focused on civic intelligence. I'm, you know, I'm going to make a game. So it's so, it's so very much open-ended uh, with this realm that, that the liberating voices are in. But I wonder if, you know, you talked about adding a parameter. I mean, that would be interesting. There's always the idea of if you add too much stuff, I mean, maybe another way to do it would be to, to say for civic intelligence, to have better, better examples, you know, this is, uh, we used it this way, we used it that way, you know, because if somebody said, well, how can I use civic intelligence? I would rather not say, you can do it, you can use it in any scale and with any project and what, even though I think that is actually true. Uh, it's, it's you, you want to be able to to, to narrow, you know, your organization and you want to do some sort of a campaign, which ones should I use that were, uh, which patterns should I use that would be useful for what I'm doing? You know, if you could just click, uh, I mean, you know, a few key buttons and then all of a sudden you get the, the, the patterns that, that are really specific for you, it'd be great, but it's, haven't been able to really figure out how to do that? It, what's what's sort of the best way, uh, which leaves them at some pretty open-ended, kind of daunting uh, potential. So I didn't. I don't think I specifically answered your question, but I I realize how important it is, especially for, in terms of usability of of these people. Don't yeah, want to yeah. idly 
glance at them and say, well, that's a cool idea. No, I think, so. I, I see, yeah, so there's something that's been, it's something that's sort of, you see the relevance, it's, 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 it's finding ways to make that work, isn't it, in a way? That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, cool, thanks. Yeah, definitely, that's, that's the problem. Joanne? Yes, um, um, I, I do have a few questions and I wrote a couple of in the chat, but I think I'll summarize into one question. Um, I do sort of see uh, the practicality side of identifying patterns within uh, uh, the context of complex systems. So I do understand the Alexander's notion of patterns there very much proven known solutions to recurring or repeatable um, problems. So you have a problem, you identify the proven working solutions. Now there are a whole uh, set of problems. I, th I think in the ACOF language, there are emergent problems or wicked problems where the problem domain cannot be clearly defined or understood because the underlying systems constantly shifting and changing. Yeah. So, and, and then we're talking about emerging, emergent patterns. That means that they are formed on the fly as uh, things uh, change, as, as things interact. So, but I, so, so I do, I looked through the library before this meeting and it was a very, very rich uh, set of patterns and many of them are very useful. So my question is two. One is, have you used any of uh, the patterns uh, in the Liberating Voices um, library or set? So that's first question. My second question is, um, have you attempted using, um, actually identifying emergent patterns to help, um, to help dealing with uh, wicked problems because these problems cannot be really identified and defined in a clear cut sense as we did, as Alexander did, uh, as uh, you did here. However, identifying these emergent patterns will help us um, understanding the nature or even the underlying structure of the potential problem they're really deep in and then finding uh, interventions very much experiments that may or may not work you know COVID is one example we've got many other uh, examples mental health poverty uh, so on and so forth uh, problems that cannot really be solved um, by known uh, solutions and known problem understandings. Um, so um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, by the way. It's very inspiring. The, the, I've, been, I've been trying to... Uh, the, I have a Google alert that comes every day on wicked problems. And so that's when I knew about this special forces Wicked problems. I mean, I think maybe the wicked problem is we have special forces, but um, the you know they're talking about firefighting. They're talking about policing, taxation. I mean, everything is now going under this title, and to me, it's it's kind of a good thing because it seems like there's a growing number of people that are saying we can't. You can't solve these problems. I mean, it's like I want to say, help me, you know. And and I mean, everybody's trying. You know, it's not that we say this is too wicked, so I'm out of here. You know, um, and so so there are there are characteristics. Um, you know, and I think that that's that's part of it is to think what are the um, what are sort of the the indicators, you know, in any little given problem. How do we know that we have a climate change problem? Well, because of carbon in the atmosphere, we, you know, the temperature in the ocean, the high, the height of, you know, and so that's part of it. Uh, 
I was reading the, I read this one, you know, the papers are coming in faster than I'm ever going to read them, that's for sure. But um, there, there was this thing on uh, biodiversity and, and uh, animals. And uh, the guy was saying, there's about nine things that people do. You know, one of the things they do is education about about trading in animals that shouldn't be traded, and and um, you know, and so so now you have at least some of the potential patterns would be each of these nine things, and then what's the different mix? You know, in different places, you can you can you can pull out aspects of what what you can do, what needs to be done. Maybe there's ways, um, like with, with the climate change, one of the patterns that you can do, you could do it in your own house. Maybe you could do it at your university. You could do it um, in your city is carbon audit. How, how are you contributing to the carbon pollution? And um, so to me, that's, that's a pattern. And, and then all the different ways of going about it, you either make up something or, um, or you see what somebody else has, has done already. And, and I sort of think that we're, I mean, these, these are wicked problems. They are very difficult, but that doesn't mean that the pieces, um, that we can't look at some of the pieces, and um, you know, one of the one of the the limitations that we have is everybody that's interested in doing something about climate change. We're not you're not going to have a conversation with all those people. You know, say there's I don't know. Let's just say there's 50 million people. So I'm not going to talk with 50 million, and they're not going to talk with 50 million people. And so, so what are the how do we how do we do the loose coordination? To me, loose coordination is a pattern. And and you think, well, how do you do that loose coordination? And I I've, I've made a list of like 15 ways that you do it. One is that you start using the same sort of vocabulary. One is you use the same goals. What you know, there's there's we're we're actually sort of doing doing it already. But you know the question is, could you do it better? And and so I think that you could. And so part of the function of a pattern is to facilitate this loose coordination, um, because you know I'm not going to solve the climate change problem in my neighborhood and expect that to make any difference in the world. But if there's a federation of neighborhoods that happens to pop up and and this is what we did here. Um, and so, you know, you might do it, do it there. And, and so, you know, there are these, there are these sort of large scale uh, collaborations that are happening. They're basically in the science community. Um, and, you know, arguably it's easier for them to do it, but, but, I, I, you know, I, I think we could do something along those lines. That's kind of um, my take. And, and I think that if we started, I don't know, like, like if half of us started saying, well, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of look at this Green New Deal thing that Doug put together and we're gonna get rid of the bad stuff and, and make it better and, uh, we're going to market it, and I don't know. You know, it's it's. This is what I'm all. I, I'm my my focus at the moment is like, you know, sharing it off the pot, basically. You know, um, and I don't. Yeah, I, I whenever I'm done with my spiel, I always think, did I even get remotely close to what the person was asking? You know. But um, yeah. let's let's yeah. let's move let's move yeah, on to Robert because Robert had a question. Okay. 
Sure, maybe I'll just read it out and then expand. So I said, what's the difference between patterns, words, concepts, and memes? Uh, do pattern languages add a sort of expressive capacity beyond what our natural languages already give us? So you started the call by referencing, I think, lingua franca and talked about how it, patterns have been wow. used for sort of uh, a form of translation uh, in, in different contexts. And uh, I attended a seminar recently at Collective intelligence is a sort of central topic of interest of mine. So I attended a seminar by Pierre Levy, who talked of IEML, uh, which is a meta language sort of concept. But uh, I was yeah. curious, are, do pattern, because I, I know David's put this idea in my head of that sometimes these are just catalogs and they don't exactly exist as like a language that you can compose, say, sentences or expressions within. Um, uh, so I don't know, maybe you could expand on that a little bit if you've seen pattern languages used more like a language and uh, how, how, where are they getting us further in a way uh, is my question. Well, one, one thing that, uh, <clears throat> one, one thing I was gonna say, uh, if I can remember, the, oh, the, the pattern languages to me, from a sort of a, I don't know if I want to say academic, that's such a negative word these days, but, but, um, but sort of intellectually, uh, you, you've got laws or, or you've got things that people really believe to be true. Uh, you know, water evaporates this, you know, and, and then you've got like recipes, do this and that. And then when you're done, add three jiggers of X, Y, Z. And, and so the, the, the pattern languages, the patterns uh, represent something sort of in the middle. They're not intended to be true. They're not supposed to be, they're supposed to be interpretable, but they're supposed to represent something that's that's worthwhile or, or, you know, for, for thinking or for action. And uh, so it's, I think that I don't want to make extravagant claims for them. You know, and that's one thing I think some people have the pattern is it, it's got to be, it doesn't always work. I said, no, it doesn't. It doesn't always work. And, and what in life always works. Uh, and so I think in just in terms of sort of a linguistic function to be to be around somewhere in the middle. In fact, I think that's one of the Alexander's patterns is, is you want something vague, you know, kind of in the middle, but but so sort of linguistically, I think that they 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 do something. Um, and, and so, and I think naming them as patterns, but naming them with specific things like, like this demystification and re-enchantment. I mean, now that we all sort of talked about it here, we might, you know, walk outside and look at some tree and say, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a hell of a tree, you know, and I don't know. Um, and, uh, but so now have people used them as a language? I think that Speaking of, of, of languages, and I've, I've noticed this with students because they didn't have any choice really. I mean, they didn't have to sign up for the class, but uh, when, we, when we kept working with these patterns, uh, people used them in their, in their discourse, you know? And uh, they begin to think with them like thinking with a word or thinking with a meme or thinking with these concepts, like you're saying. So I think that they, it's maybe not 100% natural to automatically um, just, just take off with them. You know, there's a certain sort of learning curve, but, it, but it's, you know, call it, call it pattern literacy or something. And, uh, and I noticed it, you know, uh, that, that it was actually giving us more sort of tools 
tools for thought, which is is kind of, I think what what words and concepts and, and those things that you mentioned are, we 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 use them because they they help us to accomplish something, and so uh, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I, it's it's a it's a good question, and, and the whole linguistic aspect of it is pretty fascinating because that's another thing people ask. Why, first of all, what's a pattern? Second of all, pattern language. Why is why is it a language? You know, instead of say a catalog. You know, uh, yeah. So I think we're going to wind down soon. Um, for the last question, and, and this could be a surprise because Tim has this habit of sneaking in after all the introductions are done. So Tim actually had asked me in advance whether he could get the opportunity to ask questions. So Tim, I'll give you the opportunity now. That is uh, downright devious and nasty, Danny. Um, uh, okay, yeah, I didn't have a question on the top of my mind. Uh, but I guess what I was really resonating with me that I was hearing was the sort of, I keep having this word go through my head. I think it's kind of a highfalutin word from some philosopher guy, but that bricolage idea. And oh, yeah. Douglas, yeah. Douglas seemed to speak to that earlier on and, and uh, you know, kind of a patchwork of things and more sure. pragmatic orientation to, to selection. Um, and then someone else in the chat mentioned uh, in the phrasing of their sentence, patterns of or patterns for complexity. And it kind of seemed to resonate with what Joanne, I think was trying to get at there. But do you have like a pointer? So I'm inventing a question as I can synthesize one here. You know, is there a pointer in that direction? Because that's the most uh, pointy end of the stick, you know, the most there there that I'm hearing. If I'm looking for some direction to take pattern languages beyond the shortcomings or failures of their attempt to be used in the past or disappointing impact of this or that, um, you know, wh wh where, where do you look to or where are people looking to for affordances that are up to the task of this composable wisdom for complex, wicked problems in ways that kind of accept our ignorance? And, you know, that, that is, I appreciate that question. I'm not 100% sure I'm understanding all of it. Are you talking about ways for people to sort of I'll say cut and paste with 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 patterns and, and get a bunch and sort of put them together and see how it happens. I just mean uh, actually not specifically but uh, all, given all the tools that you've looked at for yeah. kind of trying to self-organize responses to uh, difficult challenges in specifically say a civic intelligence domain or mindset dealing with with issues that, that, that people tend to focus on whether it's climate change or adaptation or these kinds of things that we point to typically these days um you know what uh, it doesn't have to be a card kit or a particular card or anything but uh you know uh, w what's the hope where, where's the direction of uh, in terms of tooling let's put it that way in the most general sense tooling or method what direction do you think you might point to for overcoming these failures and shortcomings of the past boy my um my baby monitor is on so now i'm hearing nico my grandson is now on the other floor and anyway um that's a perfect answer, by the Try way. Try not to listen to a future generation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, so I think we're I think that I think that we're talking about how how would I suggest to sort of get in there and and use them. And I'll let me let me come at it from the other side. Okay. I'm frustrated by the fact that we as people seem to have too much blocky structures in our heads and we have papers and diagrams and we talk to each other in these languages of these things and we don't get anywhere. So 
I'm frustrated by the sort of that um, conceit, if you like, in the literary sense of how we view the world or how we approach collaboration on these wicked problems. And it seems like they just simply don't fall to that kind of equipment. So, but, but in the absence of, you know, I mean, I mean, when you turn away from nice straight lines and arrows and dotted lines and, you know, objects in a diagram or patterns or words or when you turn away from these things, where, where do you look to? Which direction can you look for some kind of a strategy or an action to take that can um, undermine and uh, undermine the, the barriers, you know, make them dissolve more than they seem to, to representational? Yeah, I mean, that's, <clears throat> sometimes people say things like, we need a whole new way of thinking. And I think, well, maybe we do, but a lot of the new ways of thinking I can think about would be terrible. We would be 10 times worse than we have it now, even though many of us know that, that we do have to change the way we think. And so uh, I think that, that it's part of the reality of the situation, but I think it's viable is that, that one of the first things I think that would be really important for people to start realizing or thinking about is that these problems sort of affect everybody and that everybody does have some way in which they might play a play a part. And the other thing is that sort of drop these ideas that that uh, there's going to be um, a silver bullet and and um, that everything is going to go away if you just get the diagrams right. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, the big the big picture is just that we don't we don't have it and we, we might not ever get the, the big picture. And so, in, in fact, that's what I think intelligence is, is that you always are, have to do something and you always do it with incomplete information. You're, what, the idea of total information is completely impossible. What, I mean, you know, um, and so, so part of it, I think on, on that level, is that, that we, we, we sort of abandon, maybe abandon the idea that we have to do things by ourselves, uh, uh, think about ways that we can leverage each other's stuff better, uh, try to sort of big, build sort of bigger assemblages, throw that in with bricolage, I guess, uh, of, of people that are working together um, and then, and then I think that on a smaller scale, you know, I can use those lines and those diagrams and, you know, it's not that those things are totally, totally useless. It's just to realize that they're not everything. Um, and, uh, and then, so I think like, to the question that you didn't really ask, I thought you were maybe, is is how to get how to start getting these these putting these networks together of of things that work of of approaches that you want to take, knowing that one won't work by itself, and. Um, You know, say say that you think education is is part of working with climate change, and so uh, you think, how do I educate people around, or how do we educate ourselves in our local communities? And then, and then you say, well, let's find out what people are doing in other communities, and then say, what kind of projects? Yeah, now I'm not, I don't think I'm going anywhere particularly 
novel, but um, but I think those sort of high level generalities are are important and, and could kind of go a long way. I mean, some of my students said, you know, I I used to think I have no power at all. And, well, that's too bad, but uh, and then they said, you know, my power is limited, but it's not it's not zero, and so uh, that's that's part of it. But still, I'm thinking I'm not really getting 100 percent of what you're asking, which I I wish I was. No, I think I, that you did you did in your own way. What I got out of that was. Maybe the direction is to to a little more uh, inculcating a little more humility. Maybe it's in education systems or something to try to, um, you know, even if we don't have the positive answer, maybe we can displace some of the over expectations of and extravagant claims of of quote unquote modeling or things like this because we tend to imbue them with that silver bullet attitude like AI hey, learned AI now I can solve climate change right things yeah, like yeah. that right that's that's I think your point is maybe if we uh, have appropriate expectations for, for what we can do well and are more realistic about that, it'll maybe make room. Yeah, and also, I mean, the other side is true. You know, we don't have as much power maybe as, we don't think that those quote solutions that are out there are really solutions. But we actually, sort of the flip side is, that I think that we have the limitations on ourselves and our and our limitations on our ability to work together are not, I'll say God given. They're not they're not set in stone. We can those can be those limits can be sort of overcome somewhat. I'm not talking about a super brilliant whatever group mind, but but we could be collaborating quite a bit better than than we are now. Um, you know, I'm still work I'm still working with a lot of my students that I had and I was not in an elite university and uh, and those people, some of them have quite a lot of self-efficacy. They've made big big changes in um, in the way their communities do things, the way their, they do health, um, community health, and, and all sorts of interesting things. So um, um, I think that's that's part of it too. Is is maybe it's the demystification and the reenchantment. Okay. Uh, so this is a, this is a good opportunity. I think I think yeah. that we should probably wrap up now, Doug. So sure. the. the the, the question that, that we'll, we should close with is, um, um, well, for, so on the publicsphereproject.org, I see a contact page with an email address so people can get in touch with you. Um, what would you like to hear from people? Um, what, what are you working on now? What would you, like, you like to hear? Well, I was just sending out something, but I actually just sent it to Dan instead of to everybody. But, uh, you know, we're trying to play this, play around with this, um, repository concept, which people can come online and uh, pick the patterns they think are useful and kind of save them away. And, and, and I want to throw all other patterns in there. Uh, looking for people to review this draft article um, that I've, the one that you've seen, David. And then, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would, I would, be, I would be nice to, take some kind of quote wicked problem and and think about jointly creating a uh, a pattern language uh, around that try to market it get people to uh, uh, do different uh, different pieces of it uh, get feedback on how how well it is try to get different communities to to look at it um, that would be exciting i would love to do that okay and also i'd like to hear what other people have for ideas too um 
because I'm I'm retired. I've got nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll keep the communication. I think we'll keep the communication channels open. Um, so, so thank you so much for your time, Doug. Um, no, thanks for asking experience. me, David. I really enjoyed talking. It's I love talking about this stuff, and thanks for all the great questions. And like I said, uh, the the variety of of everybody's perspectives is just always kind of very exciting. Okay. So thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye bye.